Hi, this is Dr. Newman here. Thanks for listening to the first two parts of the lecture on sonnets. Now I'm just going to talk for a few minutes more about one of Shakespeare's sonnets to the Dark Lady. Um, it's one of his most famous ones, so let's get into that. First, we're going to take a little bit of a digression, though, and discuss um, a poem by a much less well-known uh, Renaissance poet named Thomas Campion. Uh, it's dated to its year of publication, but might have been written sometime before, but it's generally the same ballpark, and it um, uh, is a poem called There is a Garden in Her Face. There is a garden in her face where roses and white lilies grow, a heavenly paradise that is place wherein all pleasant fruits do flow. There cherries grow which none may buy till cherry ripe themselves do cry. Those cherries fairly do enclose of orient pearl a double row, which when her lovely laughter shows they look like rosebuds filled with snow. Yet them nor peer nor prince can buy, till cherry ripe themselves do cry. Her eyes like angels watch them still, her brows like bended bows do stand, threatening with piercing frowns to kill, all that attempt with eye or hand, those sacred cherries to come nigh, till cherry ripe themselves do cry. So, um... Cherry Ripe, obviously, has something to do with this woman advertising her sexual matur maturity and availability, um, and so talking about the uh, poet as, as standing uh, subject to her uh, disclosure of such. But he develops this th theme through um, a, uh, a, a motif of Renaissance love poetry known as the blazon. Sometimes it's spelled with an S instead of a Z. A genre of poems that praised a woman by singling out different parts of her body and finding appropriate metaphors to compare them with. We have her face compared to a garden. Um, her mouth, uh, her lips are cherries, and those cherries enclose her teeth, which are pearls. And um, her eyes are angels, and her brows are bended boughs, and so on and so forth. And this is a, um, a well-known example of, of a common motif in, in uh, Renaissance poetry. Um, over here, we can see a printmaker made a parody of the blazon by making an actual woman out of the metaphors that supposedly uh, her, uh, re represented her, her beauty, so that we have flowers for her cheeks, and we have her, uh, her eyes are made out of actual suns, her uh, teeth are actual pearls um her her breasts i guess are globes i'm not sure which poem that is but that's that's yeah rough um and so on and so forth um shakespeare like this print is also parodying uh this tradition when he says my mistress's eyes are nothing like the sun coral is far more red than her lips red if snow be white why then her breasts are done if hairs be wires Black wires grow on her head. I have seen roses damasked red and white, but no such roses see I in her cheeks. And in some perfumes is there more delight than in the breath that from my mistress reeks. I love to hear her speak, yet well I know that music hath a far more pleasing sound. I grant I never saw a goddess go. My mistress, when she walks, treads on the ground, and yet by heaven I think my love as rare as any she belied with false compare. Now this is a poem um, that really follows the Shakespearean model in that the first quatrain, the second quatrain, and the third quatrain continue to amplify the, the developing theme, which is a denial of the um, traditional blazon. My mistress's eyes are nothing like the sun. Coro is more red than her lips. Than her lips. If snow be white, why her breasts are done, which is a word basically meaning like tan or brown, um, which not, is not associated with beauty in Shakespeare's day. Neither is black hair. These are the associations that, that get her called the, uh, the dark lady of the sonnets, right? She's physically dark. Um, she doesn't smell like roses, her breath reeks, which is a word that probably isn't much gentler in, in Shakespeare's age than it is now. And her music, her, her, her music is a more pleasing sound than her voice. He never saw a goddess go. She walks on the ground. Love that. Um, 
but and so the turnaround comes at the volta that comes at the couplet and this comes becomes more and more typical for shakespeare's sonnets yet the the key here that reverses everything here is the idea of false compare so on the one hand he's he's um being sort of realistic in his description of her but he's also talking about the entire sonnet tradition or the, the blazon tradition in particular as being false as being untrue and what that does then is um give his claim of love uh, um a greater sincerity because he he advertises himself as being a truth teller somebody who's not going to sort of um um blow smoke up your ass as my mom would have said um so this is uh, uh, Shakespeare's playful reinterpretation of the Renaissance tradition of the blazon. And it also is thematic in terms of developing the kind of relationship that he describes through the course of sonnets number 127 to 154, the ones that are addressed to the so-called dark lady. And one of my favorite of those sonnets is um sonnet number 138 jump scare when my love swears that she is made of truth i do believe her though i know she lies that she might think me some untutored youth unlearned in the world's false subtleties thus vainly thinking that she thinks me young although she knows my days are past the best simply i credit her false speaking tongue on both sides thus is simple truth suppressed. But wherefore says she not she is unjust? And wherefore say not I that I am old? Oh, love's best habit is in seeming trust. An age in love loves not to have years told. Therefore I lie with her and she with me, and in our faults by lies we flattered be. Now, this is far from the kind of uh, philosophically uplifting, virtue-inducing love that uh, Petrarch or Wyatt or Spedner, Spencer or Sidney describes. This is a poem about basically why the best relationships are built on lies. When my love swears that she is made of truth, I do believe her, though I know she lies, right? She swears that she's honest, that she's loyal to him, that she's faithful, and he says, this is a wonderful paradox, I believe her, though I know she lies. How does that work? I believe her that she might think me some untutored youth, unlearned in the world, world's false subtleties. In other words, he, he lets her think that he is more naive than he is, thus vainly thinking that and 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 in this he thinks that maybe she thinks he's young that he that she thinks he's younger than she actually does right so vainly emptily without meaning but also vainly in the sense of vanity vainly thinking that she thinks me young although she knows my days are past the best simply i credit her false speaking tongue and simply um, is related to the idea of being simple or being a simpleton, right? Foolishly, I credit her false speaking tongue, but we know that he is not simple. He is, which is a word that ultimately uh, means single, right? Somebody who's simple has has only one layer to them, right? It's, it's a word that is the opposite of simple might be double, um, and and like multiple is the opposite of simple and we know that he's not simple he is multiple because he is thinking one thing and saying another so in this part we talk he talks about how she's a liar in this part he talks about how he also is a liar but he's lying not only to her but to himself i think that she thinks me young although she knows my days are past the best to hear he's articulating that he knows that that she knows that he's not young but he's being vain about it on both sides thus is simple truth and there's that word simple again suppressed so there so wherefore says she 
not she is unjust? Why doesn't she say that she's untrue? Why don't I say I'm old? Why, why, would, why, why do we lie if, if we each know the other one is lying? Oh, love's best habit is in seeming trust. An age in love loves not to have years told. In other words, it just works better if we just let each other think that the other person is being honest, even though we both know that we're lying. Let's not, let's not bring up rough business. This is, is it cynical? Maybe. Is it also a voice that's um, maybe been a little bit roughed up, a little bit experienced? Yeah, I think so. And I think that it's a wonderful revelation of a complicated inner life and a, and a more complicated inner life than the sort of um, philosophical, generic lover that, that Sydney fashions with Astrophil. This is a voice that speaks like the wife of Bath, um, from experience. And it, and it, it comes back to finally one of Shakespeare's, uh, favorite, um, devices, the pun. Therefore I lie with her. <laughs> I lie with her and she with me. And in our faults by lies, we flattered thee. you know, the idea is that their relationship isn't just to, um, that love isn't just to serve the other person, but to make yourself feel good, right? It feels good to love. It feels good to be loved. Part of loving is loving being loved. And this is catastrophically honest about that, that in a way that the Petrarchan tradition is not. And it's one of the things, it's that, that dramatical insight into character, that realism, that gives Shakespeare's plays their richness, their depth, and after 400-some years, their believability. Thanks for listening to this three-part lecture on Shakespeare's sonnets. We could only touch on them a little. There's a lot more to say, but hey, you got a lot more of them in your Norton Anthology. You can read them and explore these themes and ideas for yourself. Uh, like LeVar Burton used to say, don't take my word for it. Have a good day.